Now I want to switch gears here quickly in these last uh, a few minutes to talk about this uh, this bind, this tie that we do have, uh, and that is the chronic reliance of the United States and international uh, with using international medical graduates, uh, both in training and in our system. And the concern is that as we move into a time where there are going to be serious investments in the further training of uh, uh, in Africa of medical students, uh, unless we are able to control uh, in the North uh, in general, in the United States in particular, how we rely on students from the developing world to bring them into our system, we may well uh, rain on our own parade. And I think we need to be eyes open as we go into it and talk uh, with candor about the problems here. Obviously, we're facing a time of increased demand within our own system. Specialization, aging, population growth, and particularly the provisions of the uh, new Reform Act will place much greater demands in the U.S. system in the fairly near term and for the future. Um, uh, we have happily underway a major increase in medical, medical school positions, about 25% increase um, by uh, 2016 from where we were in 2005, uh, and it'll take four more years for those folks to graduate. So by 2020, we'll be graduating 25 more uh, physicians, 25% more physicians than we did uh, a few years ago. That's good and the right direction. Of course, the key to entry into practice is residency. Uh, and uh, Medicare supports residencies generously, uh, and that number has been fixed for some time. So there's a call for more Medicare-funded residencies to accommodate the increase. Now, just a quick primer here. If you look at the number of U.S. graduates that are both uh, that are uh, entering the system, uh, or uh, this is in residency, and also the number of international medical graduates, you see it's climbed over the years. Uh, it's now 27 percent uh, of entering medical students are. Uh, of entering residents are international medical graduates. That's about 6,500 a year, or 65 medical schools of 100 people cranking full time to feed our workforce. And if you look at the origin, this is from a couple of years ago where we were at 25%, but UK, Canada, and Australia do similarly, uh, and 60% of our grads come from lesser developed countries. Now, the question isn't so much the number, absolutely, but what the impact is on the country. If you look at the world, analyzing these data by the percent of workforce lost, it is in fact Africa that is the largest percent loser. Of course, there's a tiny base to begin with, so it doesn't take too many to have major impact. And the other areas, the Indian subcontinent, Caribbean, are also very poor areas of the world whose doctors leave for good reasons, but we accommodate and that will be a problem for capacity building in those areas of the world. Uh, there were in fact, uh, there was in fact an effort during healthcare reform to break the Medicare cap and uh, fund 15,000 more positions at about the rate of $1 billion a year. Just for perspective, the new Medical Education Partnership Initiative, I don't know the actual figures, but it looks to be about a 25 or $30 million a year effort. That's fabulous. But this was an ask for $1 billion a year to, uh, to fund more residents. And given the fact at the moment we hire all that we graduate, uh, this would mean more residents from abroad. So it would increase the brain aim. Uh, this strategy, this ask, was supported by our universities. So this is a plea for the global health community at the university level to talk across campus uh, to uh, their colleagues, our colleagues, uh, on the domestic side. Now, if you look very quickly at the graph, at the uh, um, uh, the flow here, if you take the current uh, year, 2009, last year, uh, 19,500 U.S. grads, about 6,500 entering in from abroad. Um, if you increase that 25% as it's going to happen and keep the residencies at the same number, we would decrease the brain drain. And this, while not popular in all circles, would be a very responsible position and help build capacity. If, on the other hand, you said, well, that 6,500 is stable, we'll increase residencies to accommodate that, we'll consider that 6,500 a kind of permanent feature of our workforce, not a good position, but one that's politically viable, I suspect, you would come out with a third bar. And finally, on the right, if you increased by that 15,000, it could be played out a lot of ways, but let's say it's 5,000 a year for three years, so you'd add 5,000 in every year. 
you would actually increase the brain drain uh, and you do it very appreciably, much more than this in the early years. So as we work to uh, support medical education, uh, there is a very high risk if we can't work on the other side that it will not net out uh, as we hope it will uh, in Africa and elsewhere. So what to do? One is to be engaged, um, to confirm, uh, to continue the strategic investments abroad as many of our universities are doing, the government will help. Self-sufficiency number two needs to be very much in our minds as a country, as an education community uh, as we go forward. And finally we need to be outspoken uh, across campus as I say and have dialogues about this with our colleagues uh, uh, across campus. Final picture, this is the Sudan. This is um, uh, the Medical Council of Sudan, uh, and this is a first um, uh, graduate, uh, first uh, certification exam that they have initiated. All Sudanese graduates will now be taking this every year. This is the future. This is quality improvement uh, in Africa. It's very promising. Two thirds of these uh, students are women. Um, but as we participate, uh, we hope in generating many more pictures like this, we need to work hard to uh, see that that uh, capacity development has maximum impact in Africa and we need to work collaboratively to, to do that. Thank you.